Today, one out of every four Christian adults believes Jesus Christ could return in their lifetime. Why? Because Jesus promised, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Where does the Bible teach that a whole generation of believers around the world will be taken in mass into God's presence at the time of the rapture and that they will never know what it is to die physically. Today, we will take you step by step through what the Bible reveals will happen at the moment of the rapture and how this mighty act of power will lead the world into the future events the Bible predicts will happen in the last days. My guests are Dr. Ed Heinsen, Dean of the Rawlings School of Divinity and Distinguished Professor of Religion at Liberty University and has written over 40 books on prophecy and served as the editor of five study Bibles. Second, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, Associate Professor of Bible Exposition at Dallas Theological Seminary and is the author of 30 books on prophecy. And third, Dr. Ron Rhodes, who also teaches at Dallas Theological Seminary and is the author of 70 books on prophecy. We invite you to join us for the special edition of The John Ankerberg Show. Welcome to our program, I'm John Ankerberg. Thanks for joining me. Again, I'm so interested in what you folks are communicating to us via the internet and in our social media site. And over eight million people every 30 days, you're talking to us and what I find so interesting, and the reason that we're doing this program is you wanna know about the second coming of Christ to earth. You wanna know what is the rapture. You wanna know what is the tribulation. You've got all kinds of questions about Bible prophecy. And I've got three of the best scholars in our country that are here to help you understand that topic. And they are Dr. Ed Heinsen, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, and Dr. Ron Rhodes. And Today, we're going to talk about why did the early church, as you read all the passages here in the New Testament, you're going to find out that the early church Christians believed Jesus could come back any moment. We call that the doctrine of imminency, if you want, and we're going to show you those verses today because they have a bearing on this. Could Jesus Christ come back in the next moment? What does the Bible say? And I want to go back on where we've already come from in the biblical passages for those of you that have missed the first couple of weeks. In the book of Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul tells the church at Corinth, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Ed, what's a mystery? What was he talking about? A mystery was something that wasn't known previously. They knew from the Old Testament and from the words of Jesus the promise of the resurrection, but they didn't understand uh, the idea of the rapture that when that would occur, uh, the living would be caught up as well as the dead would be raised. Yeah. Then we looked at Jesus' own words in John chapter 14, where Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Mark, what was he talking about? Well, I love that passage because we have a person there and we have a promise and we have a place. And we're not just looking for an event that's coming, we're looking for a person or we're looking for the Lord Jesus. And that passage, I think one of the key things it adds, it tells us when Jesus comes for us where we're going to go. Uh, we're going to go uh, to the Father's house because you know, there's some people that tell us at the second coming we're going to be caught up to meet Jesus and just do a U-turn then and come right back down to the earth. That passage tells us when He comes for us to receive us to Himself, He's going to take us to the Father's house. We're going to go to heaven. Yep. And, and Ron, people say, where does the Bible talk about the rapture? I mean, I don't see the word rapture anywhere in Scripture. All right, so folks, 
Look at the screen right now. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18. The Lord Himself, it's the Lord Jesus, shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And then He says this, The dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, and Paul included himself, shall be caught up together. Here's the word raptured, harpazo in the Greek, and Latin, rapere. So we got from rapere, we got rapture. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together, raptured with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. How does this passage connect with the other two passages? Well, it connects in a number of ways. Uh, we see this, for example, in Christ taking people from the earth, taking Christians from the earth to Himself, as we see in John 14, verses 1 to 3. You could also translate that as, receive to Myself. The way that it's described in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 and 17, is that Christ, who will come from heaven, hover in the atmosphere, and the dead in Christ rise first, and then Christ literally snatches people right off the earth. They're caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And the wonderful thing about all three passages is that we're going to be face to face with Christ, and that fellowship never ends again. And the wonderful thing also is the fact that uh, the bodies that we receive at that point, these transformed glorification bodies, they don't, not only don't get old, they not only don't die, but they're specially suited to dwelling in God's presence. Now, what could be better than that? Yep. And here's what I want folks to realize. What we've given you are the words of Scripture. You've got to come to a conclusion on what these words mean. We've studied these words, and the fact is we're coming to certain conclusions. Ed? I think it's important for people to remind themselves every Christian denomination virtually believes in the second coming of Christ. It's part of everybody's theological statement. It doesn't matter whether they're Baptist, Catholic, Presbyterian, Methodist, non-denominational, charismatic, Pentecostal, they all believe in the second coming. The question is over the when and the how. When will this happen? How will it happen? And is it something we can anticipate potentially at any moment? Yeah. And one of the things that we're going to talk about right now is how do we know for sure that Jesus could come any moment? This is what the early Christians all believed. And we're going to show that from Scripture. And along with the question, He could come at any moment, how do we know that when He does rescue Christians from the earth, He's going to rescue us from the tribulation, the wrath to come, the whole nine yards, all right? And let's begin with this passage today, which is just a fantastic passage that we want to uh, unlock for the folks. It's 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Paul writes to the Thessalonian church, and he says these words. I'm going to put them up on the screen so you can see them. You turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Guys, this is absolutely an unbelievable verse. Ron, start us off. You turned to God from idols, he says, first of all, to serve the living and true God. Well, you know, pagans believed in local deities that were represented by various forms, and they would have mouths that could not speak, they would have ears that could not hear, they really couldn't do anything. And in contrast to that, the living God is a God who's active among His people. He's busy answering prayers. He appears to them. He gives them revelation. He tells them how He expects them to act. And in the context of what we have here, He reveals things about the future, including the doctrine of imminency. And in this context, we're told that, uh, you know, he's, he's taught us to wait for His Son from heaven. I find that fascinating because notice what the text does not say. It does not say that we are waiting for the seal judgments and then the trumpet judgments and then the bowl judgments. It does not say we're waiting for Armageddon to break out after which the Lord will come. It doesn't say that. 
What it says is they're waiting for his son from heaven. In other words, the next thing on the agenda is the coming of the son at the rapture. It's the next event on the prophetic calendar. No sign precedes it. There's seven years worth of signs that precede the second coming. There's not a single sign that precedes the, the rapture of the church. Yeah, and let's drive this in even further, Mark. The fact is that the Greek verb to wait, mm -hmm. the way Paul uses it here, it's very special. Give me the definition and then give me a good illustration. Well, this word that he uses, anamenein, means literally to wait up for. So it's the idea of waiting up for someone. In other words, it's like you're expecting someone to arrive at your home and you're waiting up for that person uh, for them to arrive there. So the idea behind this is, you know, you wouldn't go to bed because the person could arrive at any moment. And this really just emphasizes the fact that Jesus can come back at any time. When, when we speak of imminency, the imminent return of Jesus, we don't mean uh, immediacy necessarily. It's, it's something that is certain that it will happen, but it's uncertain when it will happen. It, c it can happen at any moment of time. Yeah, A.T. Robertson, the Greek scholar, says it not only means to wait, but to keep on right, waiting keep for. Waiting it's for. like knowing your relatives are coming and you're waiting for them and they don't come. You don't go to bed. You stay up and you keep on waiting until they get there. John, I think, too, it's important to realize we're waiting for Jesus to come. Right. We're not waiting for the Antichrist to come. That would take a whole different approach to understanding the idea of the rapture. If he, the rapture is going to come after the time of tribulation, you're really looking for the Antichrist, where all these verses tell us we're not looking for the Antichrist, we're looking for Jesus Christ. And they were looking for Him to come from heaven any moment. Mm -hmm. That's what this word to wait up for means. This is where we get imminency. Talk about that a little bit more. Well, you're waiting in anticipation of what is going to occur. It could happen at any moment. Now, we know from Jesus' own words, we're not to set a date for the day or the hour of His coming. I like to tell people, don't waste your time trying to guess the time. Be ready all the time because Jesus could come back at any time. That's the key. You live with an eye on the sky, but your feet on the earth. We have a calling from the Lord, a job to do until He returns, but we're living in anticipation of the fact that He could come right now, and that adds a sense of urgency because of imminency. Yeah, W. E. Vine, the Greek scholar, says they were continuously and patiently awaiting the return of Jesus Christ. But Mark, where did these Thessalonians get this idea? Well, Paul had been at Thessalonica during his second missionary journey for at least three weeks' time. And uh, when Paul was there, and this is fascinating, these are people who came from paganism to belief in Jesus. And Paul was just there a few weeks, and yet he taught them about Bible prophecy. Which is fascinating because a lot of people would say today, you know, the last thing you want to talk to people about and get them confused about is, is end time prophecy, or at least don't tell new Christians about it. But Paul was there a brief period of time and told these believers about the Antichrist, the day of the Lord, the rapture, taught them all these truths. And Paul had taught them that Jesus could come back at any time. In, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, Paul says, We who are alive and remain. So he includes himself in that because Paul believed that Jesus could come in his lifetime as well. So Paul had clearly taught them uh, this idea that Jesus could come back at any moment and they were to be waiting up for his coming. Yeah, they were waiting for a son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. We've got to unpack these really critical words. What does it mean? He delivers us. He actually delivered us from something. The wrath, the coming wrath. Paul uses the definite article. What does that mean in terms of this whole subject? Did the early Christians in the church, did they believe Jesus could come back at any moment? And should we believe that Jesus could come back at any moment in the rapture, okay? And we're looking at this verse in 1 Thessalonians, and he says, we are waiting for a son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, and there, here's the key part, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Ed, what does this word delivers us mean? It's the idea of a dramatic deliverance with continuous action that He is in the process of delivering us from the wrath that shall come. The question in Bible prophecy is, what is the wrath that is coming in the future from which we need to be delivered? Yeah, 
And uh, Mark, you know, I love uh, George Milliken. He says this word deliverance refers to a mighty act of power. How do you apply that to what we're talking about? Well, you just think about the events that are going to happen when the rapture occurs. Uh, the Lord's going to descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, all the dead bodies of believers, wherever they are. I mean, in the grave, some of them have been uh, burned at the stake. Uh, some of them have been uh, eaten by wild animals. I mean, you, you think where all, the, where all the bodies are. Someone has said there's not a maverick molecule in the universe. I mean, the Lord Jesus is going to put all of those bodies together and they're going to become immortal, incorruptible, imperishable bodies. And then those who are alive in a moment of time are going to be caught up to be with the Lord and receive that imperishable body in a split second of time. The power to pull that off, it can only be done by the one who has created all things. So it's a mighty act of God's power and God's deliverance. I think you rapture. have to underline that too because even in the book of Acts, or when we witness the ministry of Jesus himself, Jesus would resurrect someone from the dead, and people witness the incredible power just in that one resurrection. But consider countless resurrections around planet Earth at the same time of countless transformations of living Christians. It's an unfathomable amount of power. But with God, it says nothing. I mean, we're talking about an omnipotent God who is perfectly capable of doing that and much more. Yeah. In the miracles of Jesus that he did, people who had never walked got up and ran away. That's physically, humanly impossible apart from a miracle of God, yes. which emphasizes the power of this miracle that'll take place when the rapture occurs. Now, sometimes critics of our view will say, well, you guys are teaching a secret rapture. Uh, because it's only for the believers. No, it's not going to be a secret. If millions of people have disappeared all over planet Earth, it's not going to be a secret. People are going to realize, wow, something happened. Now, maybe they're going to be deceived about what they think has happened, but they will know something has happened, and the sad truth is they'll know they've been left behind. Yeah, but Ron, I want to come back to this thing. He also says, who delivers us this mighty act of power, right. and then he uses ek, the Greek word ek, from, and then he says, the wrath to come. And the Greek word is the wrath with a definite article, the coming. Right. Now, let's take this word ek. What does ek mean? He's going to deliver, deliver us from. Well, it means out of or separate from. You see, God is not going to just see us through the tribulation and protect us. He's going to keep us out of the actual time period. And we see that not just in uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10, but Revelation 3.10. Same word. It's the same word that is used when we are kept out of the hour of trial, the actual time period of the tribulation. Not part of the tribulation, not half of the tribulation, not the last part of the tribulation, as some of the other views hold, but rather the entire hour of trial. The church will be kept out of it. And that phrase, uh, the wrath, is very, very important, John. Definite articles don't mean that much in English. They really don't. But in the original Greek, they mean everything. For example, if you consult some of the best uh, Greek grammars today, you'll find whole sections on the definite article and how they serve to specify things. This is a specific period of wrath that is yet to come on planet Earth. And, they and knew it is from that period that the church is to be kept out of or delivered from. And apparently they knew about it. Yes. Okay. It was, it was like a wrath that, that has never happened before and it was still coming, and Je Jesus delivered them out of or from the whole time period of whatever's coming. That's exactly right, and let's keep in mind that the person that was teaching them was well versed in the Old Testament. We're talking about the Apostle Paul, one of the best educated Jews ever, and so he would have surely also taught them what the Old Testament has to say about the day of the Lord, about the day of wrath that is coming upon humanity. Okay, Ron, we've got a specific phrase the wrath, the coming wrath, okay? And that wrath is orge, the Greek word orge. And we find it both the Old Testament and New Testament. Let's give some examples. They all knew about it. Give me an example from the Old Testament, Ed. Well, first of all, in Zephaniah 1.15, it says, the day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress. Every time you have this described in the Old Testament, it's dark, it's gloomy, it's judgment, and it has an eschatological emphasis, as A.T. Robertson emphasized in his Greek grammar, to help us understand that what is going to come in the future is unlike anything that has ever come in the past. Oh, yeah. 
Ron, give me another one from the Old Testament. That would be Isaiah 13, verse 9, which says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and shall destroy the sinners therefore out of it. John, it can't get much worse than that. Yeah. This is a definitive period, yet future, that will be the most unparalleled wrath from God ever experienced by man. And I want to throw in a word right here that's just a little off the topic. The fact is a lot of people say, oh, God's just a loving God. He's never going to judge people and yes. there's no hell. These verses suggest that God is a holy God and there's coming a time when the wrap up comes where he's going to judge everybody. Well, that's right. God is a God of love, but he's also a God of holiness who responds in wrath when his holiness is violated. And that's not just an Old Testament doctrine, that's a New Testament doctrine as well. Nobody's getting away with anything. All people will be held accountable. I think that some people think that because justice seems to be delayed that there will be no justice at all. But stay tuned for the tribulation period. That's when God's great wrath against the unbelieving nations will finally fall. Yeah. And the good news about that too is that Jesus went to the cross and He paid for our sin. He took the wrath of God for yes. us. And if you're living without a personal relationship with Jesus, you're holding on to your wrath coming your direction yourself when you don't have to. Give it to Jesus. He pays it all. You get off scot-free. It's a gift that God gives to you. But give me a New Testament illustration about the wrath that's coming. Well, Jesus, in, in Matthew 24, in the Olivet Discourse, Jesus said, For then there shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Except those days be shortened, there shall be no flesh saved. For the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. So this is a time of wrath that's in a, in a class all by itself. Yeah, and this is what Paul and was talking about in 1 Thessalonians here in chapter 1, is that this coming wrath, they were waiting for a son from heaven who delivers us from that coming wrath to keep us out of it altogether. Now, the doctrine of imminency was held by the early church Christian. We want to show just a few examples. There's over 44 examples that you could look in the New Testament. Give us one of your favorites, Ed. 1 Corinthians 1:7. Uh, you wait eagerly for the Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. If you're waiting eagerly with anticipation, you're looking forward to what is coming because He is coming for you. Mark? Yeah, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven. We eagerly wait for a Savior from there, uh, the Lord Jesus. For eagerly waiting for Him to come, I believe that tells us He could come at any moment. Right. Uh, Titus 2, verses 13 and 14, we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, it wouldn't be much of a blessed hope if we've got to go through half of the tribulation or three-fourths of the tribulation or all of the tribulation. It's a blessed hope precisely because we escape the tribulation. Indeed, we are kept out of the time period altogether. Yeah, my favorite is Maranatha. You have an Aramaic phrase and you're using it to a Greek church so they all knew what it meant and it meant our Lord come. So their greeting was shalom, hello, or, and, and our Lord come. Okay, why would they say that? Because they're expecting the Lord to come. Any moment they wanted Him to come. And Paul included himself in that. Folks, I hope that you're getting this. This is what the Bible is teaching. Now, next week we're going to jump, and because I've got these three fantastic scholars here, I'm going to ask them to do something that I wouldn't ask anybody else to do. We're going to take a chronological outline right straight through the book of Revelation. What are the events that the Bible says happen in heaven, then happen on earth? It goes back to heaven, goes back to earth. We're going to take you right straight through it, the chronological outline of the events of the last days according to the book of Revelation. You will not want to miss this. I hope you'll join us then. If you'd like to have all of the information in our new series, The Biblical Case for the Rapture of All Christians, the three programs in this series are available on DVD for a gift of only $49. You will learn how millions of Christians will suddenly be missing from the earth to meet Jesus in the air and be taken to heaven, and why the power of world leadership will shift away from the United States to the European continent. We're also offering a second series called The Five Great Events of the End Times, which answers the questions, 
When does the tribulation start? Which nations come against Israel? When will the Antichrist be revealed? What is the mark of the beast? Will America be involved in the Battle of Armageddon? The three important programs in this series are also available for a gift of $49. And finally, we are also offering our new book entitled, The Most Asked Prophecy Questions, What the Bible Says About End Times and Why It Matters Today. This 121-page book contains concise biblical answers to 78 prophecy questions I asked the late Dr. Renal Showers during a private 14-hour TV discussion. Most prophecy scholars who knew this professor loved listening to his in-depth study of a lifetime filled with scholarly study of biblical prophecy. This is a timely book, and you may order it now for a gift of $15. But then today, if you wish to have both DVDs and our new book, you may order them for a gift of $100. And you may order them now by calling us at 1-800-805-3030. That's 1-800-805-3030. Or if you wish, you may give your gift at our website at jashow.org where we have a secure place for you to give your gift. That's jashow.org. And then, for those of you who live in Canada, you may call us at 1-866-746-5803. That's 1-866-746-5803. And our Canadian website is jashow.ca. And when we receive your gift, we'll send you a receipt and a personal thank you. Finally, keep in mind that all of our TV programs are available online as digital downloads at our website at jashow.org or jashow.ca. Our goal is to present the evidence for the gospel worldwide and to encourage Christians in their walk with the Lord. This program is sponsored by the John Ankerberg Show Ministries and is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.